welcome to Health and Science, Bellezas Colombiana podcast. Today we have a very special guest. He is a double certified plastic surgeon, my friend, Dr. Mikalev. Thank you so you much for that warm welcome. I'm super excited to be here with you today. I'm so happy you drove all the way from San Antonio just to come see us. I did. I did. But it was well worth the visit. I'm happy that you are here. Can you share with our followers a little bit about yourself, about your education, where you are located? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm located in San Antonio, Texas. Um, I have a pretty broad practice. It's combining reconstructive procedures with wow. uh, aesthetics-based practice. Um, I trained um, at the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in Erie, PA. Um, following this, I did uh, general surgery training at the military's largest uh, military medical center wow. uh, for general surgery at Wright-Patterson Medical Center um, combined with Wright State University. I then went on to fellowship um, at the University of Illinois Chicago for plastic and reconstructive surgery and a, and a mi mini fellowship in Beverly Hills with the uh, world-renowned Ben Talley. Wow. Sounds like you you know a lot about like a, a lot of different things. You know, we have a pretty broad uh, training um, and practice, and I, I continue to utilize um, what I learned in training to uh, uh, provide the best possible care for all my patients. Wow. I think... When you talk about reconstructive uh, surgery, I think that's a very beautiful um, practice. Can you share a little bit about that? Absolutely. You know, we really take, uh, you know, a, a combination of lots of different principles that we learn in uh, plastic and reconstructive uh, fellowship, as well as our general surgery history, um, to really implement techniques that may not be fully defined in order to do reconstructive procedures. And these include everything from breast reconstruction to upper and lower extremity reconstruction. We do transgender care. Um, and we also do uh, a lot of trauma. And I think people don't realize that the plastic surgeon actually has a significant role in trauma principles, as well as hand surgery. Wow. I think like we all usually connect uh, plastic surgery with breast augmentation, lipo, but in reality, if somebody has a car accident, Correct. where do they go? They. That's right, right? Like, uh, you know, the people's association for what plastic surgeons actually do um, sometimes um, is not fully understood. Um, we really do have a very broad practice, possibly one of the broadest surgical specialties um, in the field, really doing everything from reconstruction to microsurgery to lymphatic surgery transgender care as well as aesthetics can we talk a little bit about the lymphatic surgery sure absolutely who will need a, a surgery for lymphatic uh, system so uh, two broad categories of individuals really are going to benefit from uh, lymphatic based procedures so really these are people that are either genetically born with uh, a syndrome called lymphedema or chronic swelling of the extremity or acquired um, in some sort of sense. And this, this is traditionally thought of in settings of uh, uh, cancer operations where the lymph nodes potentially were damaged and or removed, and then they, then they result in longstanding chronic lymphedema. Wow, so it's like very microscopic surgery. Yeah, we actually consider that super microsurgery. In social media, it's growing like this trend that they feel, some people feel that after a tummy tuck or a lipo, something went wrong and they are retain, retaining fluids after a long period of time. Yeah, there can certainly be chronic swelling after uh, liposuction or tummy tucks. During the tummy tuck, there's always a possibility that the lymphatics may have been disrupted, which leads to ultimately to some swelling. This will generally resolve by itself and, and we can utilize principles that we've learned from lymphatic massage therapy to really help um, these patients along with compression garments and things along these lines. So what happened to these patients that their surgeon don't believe in postal care? They are gonna suffer more. Yeah, I, I think people's argument <clears throat> at times, although this is not necessarily how I feel, um, are that uh, there's no great evidence um, to support 
compression and or lymphatic massage. Now, I don't necessarily <laughs> agree with that, but um, because in my current practice, in my aesthetics-based practice, and even in some of my reconstructive practice, uh, I do heavily uh, rely on adjuvant therapies really to optimize my outcomes um, uh, for my patients. Thank you. You see, he said it, and he's a double certified plastic surgeon. He said it, you need it. Absolutely. So have you seen, I know you have seen, but what is like the percentage on the customers that get post-op treatments and those that don't? So in, in my personal practice, I would say that 99% of my clientele are getting adjuvant therapies. Adjuvant therapies in my practice include everything from early mobilization, progressive tension sutures placed during a tummy tuck to really minimize uh, the amount of fluid collection that may occur. You know, this is one of the, the uh, advanced techniques that we utilize in, in tummy tuck surgery at this point. Um, uh, nutrition optimization, really to help with the wound, wound healing, compression garments, which also include lipofoam for my patients. We all traditionally utilize compression garments over a, over a three-month period postoperatively. We utilize hyperbaric therapy uh, for wound, optim wound optimization. We begin lymphatic massage therapy, uh, you know, much like you do here um, on postoperative day number one. We also utilize ultraviolet red light therapy really to help with collagen stimulation. So we're really implementing a great deal of, of adjuvant therapies really to help improve our patient outcomes and to help improve uh, the uh, recovery period uh, for our patients. It's very noticeable in, in, this, um, in this list that you just uh, mentioned, nutrition. Yeah, absolutely. I, nutrition it, it plays a significant role in post-operative care. You know, poor nutrition can lead to significant swelling that fails to resolve. It can lead to poor wound healing over time, and really uh, change your ultimate outcome. I always I always tell my patients, uh, and I'm a big believer of this, that. 50% of the outcome is by technique, what we've done in the operating room. The other 50%, honestly, is what we do afterwards to really optimize our, our results and really exceed our patient outcomes, our pa patient expectations, excuse me. Wow. I wish everybody think like you. Well, they could. <laughs> Continue <laughs> your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if they keep going to school, they keep learning. Like we find information every single day. Yeah. And um, I think we're all lifelong learners at this point, right? Like I, I think that if we stop uh, the pattern of education and, and the, the drive to continue to learn, then I think it's probably time for us to no longer be in the field, right? Because techniques and advances are changing by the hour or by the day. Um, you know, we've seen so many advances and, you know, it, throughout all of the surgical specialties, including, you know, the field of plastic and reconstructive surgery, it's really pretty incredible. You know, if you look back 10 years, some of the techniques that we do now just didn't even exist or some of the technologies that we have now, you know, 10 years ago, very few people, if anybody, really relied on uh, lymphatic massage therapy or compression garments. Um, really, it was a, a complete reliance on the technique. In Colombia, when I started like this journey was 20 years ago. And like you said, technology was completely different than what we have today. But like some people for, forgot that at the same time that plastic surgery is evolving, post-operative care have to evolve as well. Correct, that's absolutely critical. Uh, we, we cannot stay stagnant as a society or as a group. Right now, there is many surgeons, even in Colombia, that the only thing they know about post-operative care is lymphatic drainage massage and ultrasound. That's the only thing. Oh, sometimes radio frequency. Sure. But uh, there is so many like different technologies that we can use on the post-operative care that are going to improve up to 30% yeah. their surgeries. Yeah. Then we add what you mentioned, nutrition, compression. There is many things that we can use. So 
their surgeries can be actually what they were looking for, the results they were looking for. Yeah, I mean, I think that the most critical aspect is really to initiate that adjuvant therapy immediately postoperatively, uh, you know, within 24 hours. And that's really what I try to do in my practice. I try to see my, all my patients on postoperative day number one in the morning. Uh, once that's done, then they head on over to my lymphatic therapist in San Antonio and, and begin therapy. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly understand that there's, you know, lots of surgeons that may have concerns with starting uh, ther lymphatic therapy after a tummy tuck immediately. Many will wait, you know, up to two weeks. Um, you know, that's just simply not what I do in my, my current practice. I, I really do think that it, it clinically has shown some significant improvement in swelling, pain, bruising that we've seen and really optimized our outcomes in a much shorter period of time than, than we would have uh, expected without uh, any therapy. Can you mention, I know you are very strict with your protocol, post-op protocol, but can you share with us negative effects of waiting for too long to start any lymphatic drainage? Yeah, I mean, uh, some of the negative effects associated with, you know, in, at least in my personal practice, you can end up with contour irregularities, you can end up with wound problems secondary to, to uh, excessive swelling, you can end up with increased pain. Um, and that's, I, I would say that that's a big factor, right? I think people don't associate uh, pain with um, uh, lymphatic massage, but in fact, you can significantly improve the patient's um, uh, overall post-operative pain by doing these procedures. Wow. I wish they actually listened to you. <laughs> they have to start 24 hours after surgery. Yeah. You start inflating, inflating. So the more fluids that you retain, the more complications you are going to develop. Yeah, I always, it, it's always so funny. You know, all my, all, I always show my patients the next day when I see them in the clinic, uh, you know, their, their on-table results because I'll take videos intraoperatively. Then they look in the mirror, uh, you know, on postoperative day number one, and and you know, there's pretty significant swelling. They don't even look like the same person on the operating room table. Really, to get us back to, at, at the very minimum, the result that we had on the table, if not better, that's why I use those adjuvant therapies. I don't think people realize that just by doing a tummy tuck, that you're not going to really achieve the the silhouette or the the shape that everyone's really trying to go for. You really have to combine body contouring with liposuction, potentially some radio frequency skin tightening, really to optimize the the overall silhouette um, of that patient and really provide a much smaller waist and give more definition to their their hips. That is where technology comes handy. It is, yes. That's why they had to go to a double certified plastic <laughs> surgeon. <laughs> That knows how to use their fancy machines. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's so funny because there's so many therapies out there these days and it's very easy to get lost into, you know, what are the best, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, therapeutic devices because at the end of the day, you know, plastic surgery is still a business, right? And these machines do cost a lot of money. Um, and, uh, you know, as long as there is good clinical outcomes, then I see there's a there's a role in my personal practice. Um, certainly, I cannot by any means acquire every possible machine out there, nor do I want to offer every machine. But the, the ones that really optimize outcomes are really the ones that I'm utilizing in my practice. So technology actually has a lot to do with results and also with the trauma. Because I, I remember this plastic surgeon, a specific plastic surgeon, that I was still a plastic surgeon, but he, his customers, when they came here, they were going through so much pain, so much trauma. And I, at first I didn't understand why if this surgeon is doing this surgery, the same as the like customer B, but she's able to recover faster. Correct. It, it really happening. does have to do with uh, technology because as technology is advanced, we've also seen more atraumatic um, devices, uh, really from, you know, if we look at liposuctioning uh, technology as an example, 
you know, we're, we're using technology nowadays, not to name any specific brands, but we're using technology that is much more atraumatic in harvesting um, or the separation techniques that are related to the liposuction procedure. In the past, we used to utilize nothing different than essentially uh, a fancy cannula attached to some suction. Um, um, and it really has advanced over, you know, the last, you know, 10 or so years um, in terms of what we can do, how far we can take our outcomes, um, and still be, the biggest key, I think, is still being safe. That's the key, being safe. See, so many people are dying, for example, in Miami. Mm -hmm. We see that every day, somebody dying in Miami. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've seen, you know, in the last, uh, I think it's been about the last year or so, we've seen new regulation come down and, uh, you know, in the, you know, the Miami central central area related to the, the higher morbidity and mortality rates associated with these procedures in that in that region. And of course, there's plenty of very good plastic surgeons in the Miami area. And by no means am I excluding that. But um, what gives it a bad name are the individuals that are not plastic surgeons that are conducting these procedures. We, we've seen, you know, other specialists, family doctors, ob even cardiologists, um, cosmetic surgeons, right, in, the, in that region that are doing procedures that are, they are simply not boarded to do. Or there are individuals doing procedures in facilities that are not even accredited in any form or fashion. Wow. Um, and so we all recognize that, you know, plastic surgery inherently comes with risk, right? Any operation comes with risk. And, you know, as, as a board certified plastic surgeon, you know, my, my job is to mitigate that risk as much as possible to really ensure my patient um, uh, has the most minimal risk possible to undergo this procedure. So it's unbelievable. So any doctor can actually per perform a plastic surgery? Uh, they're not supposed to. <laughs> doctor, what is the difference between a family doctor and a plastic surgeon? So two very different specialties. The family physicians are boarded by the American Board of Family Physicians, uh, which oversees that specific specialty. Our, our particular specialty, plastic surgery, is boarded by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Both have very defined scopes of practice. Um, which are overseen by each of these respective boards. So very different overall specialties. Certainly um, family physicians are not trained, uh, you know, to conduct uh, uh, major surgical procedures. Okay, so basically even plastic surgeons have to be a family doctor first? No. So uh, a plastic surgeon, uh, there are multiple routes on how you can become a plastic surgeon these days. There are independent routes, which is what I have done for my training, which means that there was a, another surgical specialty achieved. So that could have been general surgery, ENT, which is ear, nose, and throat, orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery. There are multitude of other surgical specialties that you can then hop over and then do a fellowship in plastic and reconstructive surgery for three years uh, and become a plastic surgeon. In total, how many years you've been studying? Enough years that I lost all my hair. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of years. I mean, um, you know, we do four years of medical school. We do an internship and a residency, which usually combines about uh, for general surgery is five additional years. Following that, there's an additional three years of fellowship time or residency uh, time. Now, there is a secondary pathway by which you can actually become a plastic surgeon these days, and it's called an integrated path, which uh, tends to be approximately six years in length in total following medical school. So, uh, this is a route that really kind of became prevalent in probably the last five to six years where uh, medical students that are now applying to residencies can apply directly to plastic surgery instead of becoming a board certified general surgeon, which is probably the most typical um, specialty in the independent pathway. Then they just skip over all of that and become only a plastic surgeon. Um, wow. So we are talking... All the way to high school is 12 years, plus five to become a 
Yeah, so five for to become a general surgeon and three more to become uh, a plastic surgeon plus medical school time for more years. So that's 12 years just by itself well, without so including undergrad time. So if you include undergrad time, uh, you know, four additional, you know, three to four additional years, depending on, you know, what you did in your undergrad. Uh, so you're looking somewhere around 16 years, assuming that there were no hiccups along the way. So 12 plus 16. Wow, that's a long time. Yes. That's why you have more knowledge then. That, that's why I have no hair. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It Guys, the bags that he makes, wow, very defined. I love what you are doing. I love like you're giving the confidence back to many, many females. I love what you're doing. Thank you so much. And, you know, I, I think that's really what drives us in this specialty. We're really, you know, taking, uh, you know, a woman or a man that may have lost, you know, significant confidence. And that's whether that is, you know, uh, originating from, you know, genetic deformities trauma where they're needing reconstruction, cancer where they're potentially needing reconstruction, or aesthetics where they've had potentially multiple pregnancies. We're really giving that individual the ability to really have that confidence again, really kind of restore. Uh, I always say I, we really are kind of restoring normal anatomy where anatomy was lost. Um, and, you know, we, we are really very much a specialty that has the ability to transform lives. Can you share with us the latest surgery that you perform? Like we talked about from the beginning, I have a very broad practice at, at this, uh, you know, at this present time. You know, part of it's all reconstruction, part of it is uh, aesthetic based. You know, I, I had a very interesting surgery recently. Uh, you know, don't we don't come across it that often, but I had a beautiful young woman who unfortunately was recently diagnosed with uh, recurrent, uh, what we say, vulvar cancer, cancer essentially of her vagina. Wow. So, uh, you know, the one thing with plastic surgeons is we find ourselves working with just about every other surgical specialty um, in order to really assist in the reconstructive efforts um, for these individuals. So the, the cancer was all taken care of, thankfully, by her uh, gynecologist, gyne-oncologist. Um, and then, um, you know, I was called to the operating room recently to do a, essentially a vulva reconstruction or vaginal reconstruction. We created a flap. We used those techniques that we talked about earlier in order to really give her back or restore that anatomy that had been lost. And, it, you know, it was very successful. She has complete sensation down there um, at this point as well. Wow. So, you know, really something that you know, can restore true quality of life um, and wow. confidence. You know, can you imagine, you know, going through life without anything down there? Wow, you're doing actually something very important. Yeah. Very, very important. I can't even imagine the trauma, like how she felt without a vagina. Correct. You know, and um, it it's definitely touching to be able to be a part of those individuals' lives, you know, uh, uh, it's very rewarding in a lot of ways. And so, you know, a lot of people always ask, you know, can I can I give up the reconstructive efforts and do just just aesthetics? And I at this point in my life, I can't I you know, I still really love giving back quality of life where quality of life was lost um, and giving back confidence for the individuals that sustained some sort of trauma, whether that's physical or mental because of some surgical procedure, like for example, in, in breast cancer, where a woman has lost uh, her breast because of uh, underlying breast cancer. You know, I always say that a lot of women's confidence comes from their breasts, right? And imagine those being completely gone. You know, we, we play a very large role as plastic surgeons in doing breast reconstruction following uh, breast cancer removal or mastectomies. Um, and you know, that's so impactful where we can really give that woman back, you know, the, the one of the defining factors for womanhood, right? Her breasts. I cannot picture it. Yeah. Like, I understand. I'm a woman. I understand how important my breasts are for me. Right. So if I picture a woman that is going not only to the trauma, losing part of her body, but it's also taking medication, going through all the process. And even after taking all the medication, they ended up without breast. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's but you very are giving, unfortunate. You are giving them happiness again. I I hope. Wow. I, that's what I. That's all I can. That's all I can hope for. And um, you know, at the at the end of the day, you know, we as plastic surgeons or any specialists, right, within the field, we're given a gift, right. And our hope at the end of the day is to provide that gift to do some sort of good. And, you know, that's my, my parents always said, just leave the world having, you know, done something good in your life. I've done lots of bad things, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, but, but that's but, beautiful. Like, I, because I'm just taking patients that did a plastic surgery, like a cosmetic. Sure. So I never put myself in that situation when you actually need the surgery. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I, I still love what I what I do from the reconstructive um, aspect. I'll continue to do that for a number of, you know, a number of additional years. I still love doing hand surgery. I still love doing trauma. I still do love doing all the reconstruction. What do you mean hand surgery? So plastic surgeons have a significant role in the functional and reconstructive aspects of the, the hand. So, you know, many of us will still do um, uh, all the reconstruction uh, and we will share this traditionally with uh, orthopedic surgery um, or orthopedic hand surgery, where we do all the reconstruction essentially from the elbow to the fingertips. Wow. Um, and so, um, you know, I was, I was, uh, you know, I wouldn't say lucky enough, but um, I had a significant role to play um, in the, um, pause for a sec. I can't remember what the name, uh, what, what was the name of the town where the shooting was? Uvalde. Uh, the Uvalde shooting, because I took, I did the reconstruction for the, the teacher that lost the, the arm. Wow. So, thank you, I forgot the name of the town, but, um, um, uh, I can't say the town, but I can just say like, you know. The, oh, the and the man shooting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, but no, I, I recently had the opportunity to, you know, have a significant role in, you know, the reconstructive efforts um, of an upper extremity after a mass shooting, um, you know, here in this region. Um, and, you know, that was very impactful and that that I would say changed my life for sure. Um, you know, to give someone back functionality where functional where uh, functional anatomy has been lost uh, was, you know, really pretty incredible. You are opening my mind to uh, many different questions. <laughs> wow, it's unbelievable. But a bullet can do so much damage. Yeah, it can do not only can it do physical damage, it can do functional damage. And and, you know, we we clearly see, you know, every day we see, you know, mental damage done for sure. Plastic surgery is a very, is a truly incredible field, right? I, I don't think there's anything else like it. Um, it transcends every other surgical specialty. Um, but you know, the, the funny thing is like, we've learned lots of our techniques by um, co-mingling or, or um, working very closely with other surgical specialties. Um, and that's the one nice thing, you know, I, I know you recently saw that um, uh, the announcement on my Instagram page about being selected by the uh, American yes. uh, College of Surgeons to be a, a fellow for the American College of Surgeons. And that's the, you know, this, this organization is a beautiful organization. Essentially, it picks the, the, the top surgical specialist in the, in the nation um, to be part of this organization. And essentially what happens is, uh, it's an organization which allows essentially co-mingling among surgical specialties to find different techniques and advances that work uh, uh, coherently with one another. What? You know, lots of our advances have come from techniques that we've learned from other specialists and, and vice versa. Basically, it's a lot of smart people like you that come and share their techniques. Well, I don't know how smart I am. <laughs> you are. <laughs> You're a double certified plastic surgeon. Yes, yes. And I'm, I'm blessed to, to have that, that notion at this point. Truly an honor to be here with you today. You know, not only are you like, uh, you know, a beacon for other, you know, lymphatic therapists in the nation, but also as, as a woman business owner. Um, and, and, you know, you have a lot going on. You know, your mother of you know, two teenagers, essentially. Um, 
and you know you have a lot of demand going on and i i look forward to the things that will happen uh hopefully together as friends and as business people in the future doctor where can they find you so reminder you can follow me at, at dr mickliff on instagram you can also see me at mickliff plastic surgery on instagram um i also have pages on those same pages on both tiktok and facebook um and our website which will be um, www.mickliffplasticsurgery.com should go live August 1st. Hope to see you guys soon.